Right. So, this video is overdue by about two and a half thousand years. And it is about how you, yes, you, can get the last laugh out of a very old joke first told by a hack comedian back in the 80s. No, not those 80s. These 80s. The punchline is soulmates. The joke is complicated. And if we don't figure out why the guy who wrote it thought it was funny, it can legit ruin our lives. So, you know, no pressure. If by chance you are a believer in soulmates, you're not alone. According to a poll from Monmouth University in 2017, 53% of single women and 47% of single men said they believe in soulmates. A set of figures that Brian Onishi at TheConversation.com reports far surpasses the percentage of Americans who believe in the biblical God. But like any widespread belief, I don't think the concept of the soulmate should get a pass to embed itself in our collective worldview without some scrutiny. Who convinced the world that soulmates were even a thing? And just how much should we let their ideas of love take up space in our heads? Feel free to file those questions away in temporary storage, while I attempt to use the androgynous sounds of my voice to justify the outrageous claim. Soulmates are a joke. It started the whole world. Okay, stop me if you've heard this one. Many years ago, in a land called Greece, there lived a man named Plato who wrote a lengthy text on the nature of love called the Symposium. And in the Symposium, a character called Aristophanes claims that long ago, mankind looked astonishingly different from the way they look now. They had four arms, two faces, two sets of genitals, and a total of three genders, one for each love god. These humans were big, strong beings by whom the gods of Olympus felt threatened, so mighty Zeus, sensible and not at all insecure guy that he was, unceremoniously cut them in half, leading each of the resulting smaller life forms to feel woefully incomplete and compelled thereafter to seek their other half. Now, I can't presume to understand a writer's motivations multiple millennia after their text was completed, but I think it is perhaps worth mentioning that Aristophanes, the character through whom Plato chose to tell this story, was a playwright in real life with whom Plato did not get along. So keen was Plato's dislike for Aristophanes that he publicly blamed him for the death of Aristotle, claiming that an unflattering caricature penned by Aristophanes indirectly caused the most famous hemlock poisoning in history. So in light of that little knowledge nugget, I get the impression that Plato might have been one of those petty authors using a manuscript to punish fictional versions of his enemy. Which of course makes the Aesop-esque moral of his story, for Christogram's sake, don't write people you hate into your book. It might become popular with readers who don't get your sense of humor and oops, your enemy is immortal now. Nevertheless, Aristophanes is remarkable in his own right, because between gigs as Plato's arch nemesis, he was widely considered the father of comedy. Some of his plays, like Lysistrata and The Clouds, not only survive to this day, they are damn near required reading for pretentious theater weirdos trying to seduce more interesting people. While Aristophanes is not my favorite playwright, I have read just enough of his work to know exactly what Plato was talking about when he complained about the notorious Aristotle caricature. And just to give you an idea of how sophisticated the humor of Aristophanes actually was, when asked by a disciple if the buzzing of a gnat comes from its mouth or its butt, the Aristotle caricature replies, The gut of the gnat is narrow, and in passing through this tiny passage, the air is driven with force toward the breach. Then after this slender channel, it encounters the rump, which is distended like a trumpet, and there it resounds sonorously. Yep, you heard that right. One of the oldest jokes in the world, penned by one of the most lauded playwrights in the world, amounts to net farts tee hee. Consequently, when Plato takes the story of man's insatiable love quest and puts it in the mouth of a humorist he does not like, I can't help but feel that maybe he wasn't expecting the story to be taken seriously and ended up playing a room that was too afraid to laugh a couple thousand years after the death of his target audience. While Plato's Symposium is thought to be the origin of the soulmate concept, it is not the origin of the word itself. The honor of naming the phenomenon goes to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, one of those sad English poets in the collection of laudan-fueled pisshands known as the Romantics. No, not those Romantics, these Romantics. For those to whom the name is unfamiliar, Samuel Taylor Coleridge is best known for the rhyme of the ancient mariner, and from his vantage point in a famously unhappy marriage, he wrote the words, To be happy in marriage, in order to not be miserable, you must have a soulmate, as well as a house or yokemate. Though Coleridge was by no means the comedian that Aristophanes was, his outlook on love was perhaps a touch more cynical than one would expect from the first ever evangelist of the soulmate, 
as evidenced by the somewhat pithier quote, the most happy marriage I can picture would be the union of a deaf man to a blind woman. So points for questionable humor as a coping mechanism, I guess? Anyway, that's the setup, folks. Let's talk about the payoff. If by some whim of fate, you did not have the melancholic privilege of witnessing American pop culture toward the end of the 20th century, it is hard to express with words just how ubiquitous the word soulmate was in any fictional work with a romance angle. Sabrina had one. Xena had one. The Justice League had one. The Candyman had one. Superman got one. The other Superman got one. I get one. You get one. Everybody gets a soulmate, says all manner of turn-of-the-century fiction. But out of that last round of clips, the two that are most interesting to me are the ones that show Christopher Reeves and Robin Williams in a pair of surreal films called What Dreams May Come and Somewhere in Time. Not only do both these works contain a soulmate bond so strong they transcend time and space, both movies were based on popular books from back in the 70s by author Richard Matheson. The popularity of What Dreams May Come, the novel, in 1978 and A Bid Time Return in 1975 would be consistent with the observations of Brad Wilcott, professor of sociology at the University of Virginia and guy with sufficient street cred to be quoted by the BBC, who reports a rise in the appeal of soulmates since the 1970s citing the decline of dependence on marriage for economical security as a probable culprit. Quoth he, People are now more likely to look for relationships that make them happy and fulfilled. There is a shift from a pragmatic approach to marriage to a more expressive soulmate model, where people's expectations are more psychological and less material. Richard Matheson, incidentally, was a prolific writer with a career spanning nearly five decades. Other culturally significant works from him include, but are not limited to, the Omega Man, I Am Legend slash The Last Man on Earth, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Hell House, A Comedy of Terrors, and Jaws 3D. I bring this up with zero intent to devalue Matheson's stuff or insult anyone for whom his more romantic works were precious, but merely to point out that if we pursue love expecting it to look the way it does in what dreams may come, we might realistically pursue a shark hunt expecting it to look like Jaws 3D and get less disappointing results. As for any rational thinkers out there who are even now scoffing because writers aren't responsible for our assumptions about love, even if the writer's name is Plato, that if you believe someday your prince or princess will come, that's on you. And don't people know the difference between fantasy and reality anymore? Well, first of all, not as well as we should. Second of all, while it is not productive to blame our love life fiascos on bad reactions to stories told by unscrupulous storytellers, if all we ever see is dysfunctional love in life, and mandatory happy endings in media. Just how mature a mate can we hope to be for another person? I'm not entirely sure I've internalized an answer to that, but I think our best hope of happiness with a real world life partner may be to reevaluate the soulmate as an ideal. If not through the lens of humor, then maybe through one that's a little less rose tinted than those customarily offered to us by romantic escapism. Naturally, I wasn't clever enough to think this up all by myself. According to Brian Oshini, the same writer from earlier quoted in a different article this time, the soulmate myth promises fulfillment. It says that the isolation and loneliness that are so often part of the human experience are only temporary, that someday there will be a happily ever after, in which we are united with the one who understands us at every level, protects us from harm, and gives our life overwhelming significance. In other words, the temptation to see our life as an inevitable source of narrative satisfaction and a thing that follows a three-act structure can sometimes get the best of us and hurt us more than it helps. Then again, at the end of the day, our real-life desire to find a soulmate, aka the one as opposed to some one, is basically good, right? Because if seekers of true love want solid relationship that lasts a lifetime, they have every right to have high expectations so neither partner ends up miserable down the road. So where's the balance? And is the concept of the soulmate truly as laughable as the smartasses who wrote it into existence may have thought it was? Well, according to Kate Bishop, the author of that BBC article I keep cribbing notes from to try to sound smart, what works hardest against dogmatic believers in the soulmate is that they tend to have a destiny mindset. Since they are holding out for a perfect person, they are more likely to doubt their relationship or view a hiccup in the road as a deal breaker. Perhaps this just wasn't their person after all. Bishop goes on to suggest that soulmate skeptics, a thing you can be while remaining an optimistic believer in the one, tended to have a growth mindset. They believe that relationships take work and compromise, and are motivated to find solutions to problems. So to sum up, the soulmate may have begun as the joke that started the whole world crying, but the concept has undergone some metamorphoses since then. 
and if the idea brings you comfort, you may rest assured you are normal and human. Just maybe once in a while, remind your fellow believers that perfect is not the enemy of good, and if your partner and you cannot grow together, perhaps you shouldn't go together. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. Like and subscribe if you want to or dislike and complain. The YouTube robots measure attention on an absolute scale, so it helps the channel either way. Until we meet again, take it easy. Loves you. Bye.